Hello students. In today's session, I'll be giving you an overview of what the DigiNerve app will provide you. So I'll be basically giving an introduction to what this app is all about. And basically, we will be discussing about the introduction to medicine. That's what. How do we approach the subject of medicine? And what are the things that you're expected to know in this field of medicine? So there's a quote uh, by Siddhartha Mukherjee the, in the book, The Emperor of All Melodies. He says, medicine, I said, begins with storytelling. Patients tell stories, describe the illness. Doctors tell stories to understand it. And science tells its story uh, to explain the disease. So basically, medicine is about stories and very important for us to be a good medical student or a medicine practitioner is to have that aptitude to listen to these stories. Every patient comes with its story, every disease has its story, every disease manifests with its natural history. We have to be patient enough to hear to that and that would give us the idea what the disease is all about. Also. When we understand this and possibly look into it, we will be able to write about it, we will be able to approach about it and we will be able to tell these stories to the future. And based on these stories, based on these manifestations, that's how the science of medicine evolved. So medicine is all about storytelling and very, very importantly, we have to be very good and patient listeners to the story. The subject of medicine has been there for ages to gather and medicine has evolved from the times where clinical medicine was of paramount importance to the present state where we have so much of investigations. There are so many aids of investigations that have come that uh, we, the clinical medicine has slightly taken a back uh, seat possibly and investigative medicine has come up. However, students, please remember the basic clinical medicine, the history taking, the speaking to the patients would generally be more sufficient to give the diagnosis and also to be uh, good to the patient. The investigations may help us to uh, diagnose the problem. The investigations may help us to localize the disease. The investigation might tell us a lot of things about the disease, but actually the investigations may sometimes be misleading. So if we investigate and do all the investigation for any given patient, we would find a lot of abnormalities possibly, which may not truly be abnormal. And we, uh, if we go behind this investigative medicine, we generally tend to lose track and we might be uh, on a total wild goose chase. So clinical medicine is the basis of the entire medical profession. So we have to be patient. We have to be a patient listener. We have to be a patient teller and we have to analyze and then come to a conclusion. Medicine as a subject has been there for long and the traditional medicine, the theory part of it, the practical part of it, etc. has been evolving since many, many years. From the good old days where we had only uh, clinical case presentations and history taking and eliciting of science, now we have a mixture of possibly the old school where we have the case presentations and then we have the vivas where we have the oskis that are kept or there is investigation based questions that are being asked. So clinical medicine has changed, the clinical approach to medicine has changed. Also the way that we assess a student has changed over times. So in this session students, I will be giving you an overview of what is expected of a medicine student. I can only give you the suggestions possibly you have to implicate it on yourself. You will have to learn on yourself. You will have to learn from your patients. You have to learn from your seniors. You will have to learn from the books. A wide array of books is available and medicine is an open field. There is no limit for it and there is no end for learning. Students generally when we see the medicine uh, curriculum as far as we uh, practice that in the medical colleges, you have the theory portions and you have the practical exams that we have and the viva voce that's there and off late the new sort of uh, patterns that have been evolving that's the case-based learning and the problem-based learning 
and what is very uh, important for you in the future would be the multiple choice questions that are available there. So the multiple choice questions are uh, practiced both in your uh, theory papers as well as when you go for your entrance examinations later that would have this uh, multiple choice questions that would come. Let's basically begin with each one of them and discuss a little about each of them. So the first thing that we are going to discuss is about the theory exams that you have, the theory curriculum that we have. So first thing let's discuss about the theory. So medicine is a vast subject, every system in the body is part of medicine and medicine is one thing that is needed for all other allied specialties, be it surgery, be it orthopedics, be it obstetrics and gynecology and to a certain extent the ENT and ophthalmology also. So medicine is having a, a large number of topics that uh, generally require to be covered under theory and based on the new CBME curriculum also we have the most number of competencies that have been asked by medicine to be covered. And you know medicine is a three year subject, you started right from second year, the third year and your exams would be only in your final year that you would get the uh, uh, finishing your course of medicine. So the theory topics are vast and they are most related to the systems that we discuss. So generally the theory portions of medicine are system based. Uh, there could be general parts but then majority of the discussions that we have under theory topics are pertinent to certain systems. You would have learnt your basics in anatomy and physiology and biochemistry in the first year and when you come on to the second year you would have learnt about the pathology, the microbiology and very importantly the pharmacology. So all this together amalgamation of that along with possibly a clinical correlation would help you to understand each of these topics. So we have a wide variety of topic possibly starting from the simple nutrition and uh, environmental medicine where you would be learning about the various nutritional requirements, the deficiency states, the excess states and the new upcoming pandemics of obesity that's coming up a lot. We'll be discussing each of these topics in separate sessions that would be there. So nutrition is of paramount importance for us basically how to rehabilitate a patient, possibly a patient who is post-operatively, he is not able to take orally, how do you give nutrition? If supposedly a patient has undergone a malabsorption syndrome and the gut is not absorbing, what do you do in such a situation? If the patient requires prolonged nutritional care, how do we do about it? So all these things are covered under the nutritional topic that is there and that is of very much importance for practically every disease we will have to look into the nutritional aspect. Environmental topics are important in specific situations, possibly the water related, the temperature related, the high temperature, the low temperature disorders are common. We have to be aware of them. Next coming on to the important topic of endocrinology. Endocrinology is a vast topic. We have large amount of endocrine organs that are there in the body and each of the organs have specific functions. And if the function is low, it manifests differently. If the function is abnormal, it increased, you will have different manifestations. And very importantly, it is linked to various organs of the body. The cardiac is involved, the GI tree is involved, and the musculoskeletal system is involved in the endocrinology. So we have to understand the basics of how an endocrine organ functions and what are the abnormalities with each of the organs. Important two organs which come under this that is mandatory for you to understand is the thyroid and the adrenal glands. The next and the most important, the pandemic that's there of diabetes. It's been rising and India is go soon going to be the diabetic capital of the world. So we have to be knowing everything about diabetes. So we have to know the types of diabetes, the newer types of diabetes, the classification, how do we diagnose diabetes, what are the drugs that are there in our armamentarium for the treatment of diabetes. We have to understand also the complications of diabetes. Diabetes is an important thing that you have to know as a basic clinical doctor because any specialty you go, diabetic related complications would be there, be it ophthalmology, be it uh, gynecology, be it surgical, be it orthopedics, any, comp any specialty you go, you would find diabetes related disorders. And diabetes by far is one of the most common things that you see in your outpatient practice in the future. And for your exams, diabetes is asked in theory, it's asked in your practicals, it's asked in viva, so everywhere, including a large number of multiple choice questions come from the endocrinology diabetes chapter. The next section is infectious disease, so you have a large number of infections and with the COVID pandemic coming up now, you do have large number of diseases that are there 
and India being a developing countries we have peculiar diseases to India be it tuberculosis be it leptospirosis be it dengue malaria all those diseases are there so we have to know this because this is one of the common communicable diseases that could be there also they could cause mortality so we have to know thoroughly about the infectious diseases we have to know the diagnostic criteria we have to know the management and what complications would ensue hiv is also on the rise so hiv the pandemic of hiv is also on the rise and we do have to know thoroughly about hiv we have to know the drugs that we have we have to know the opportunistic infections and how do they coexist and how do we manage about it once you finish this maybe possibly in your third year or onwards you would be starting the systems that would be there so the respiratory system possibly sometimes it will be taken from the pulmonology department again a very very common disorders that we encounter the copd the bronchial asthma the obstructive airway diseases very very common and common long cases for uni exam so you have to know thoroughly about it we should know about the pulmonary tuberculosis we have to know about the restrictive lung diseases we have to know about the suppurative lung diseases and pneumonias also we have to know about type respiratory failures and the types of respiratory failures the pleural diseases the pleural effusion pneumothorax the pulmonary embolism all are of very much clinical relevance so we have to know about them coming on to the main system that we have is cardiology and in almost all centers the cardiology gets as a long question in one of the papers so it has a maximum marks of all the systems that we cover so cardiology have a wide array of diseases from valvular heart diseases infective endocarditis the congenital heart diseases the ischemic heart diseases the hypotensive heart diseases the vascular heart disease of the aorta the dvt pulmonary embolism etc all come under this so we have a wide variety of this and a very very important section on arrhythmias so arrhythmias are common and causes of death also so we have to know how to read an ecg and how to approach various arrhythmias hematology again a very very vast topic where you have the blood and the blood related disorders the increase or decrease of the components of the blood can have various manifestation and again a very very common disease that you would encounter in your day to day practice anemia you get a large number of cases in your exams maybe just anemia or related to any other disease so you have to know thoroughly about anemia you will have to know about the blood cancers you have to know about the clotting factor and disorders again they are common and we have to understand about them and know the management the rheumatological and connective tissue disorders again a common disease especially young females do develop it so rheumatoid arthritis lupus the spondyloarthropathies and vasculitis are important the gastroenterology system you have a large number of cases that is kept of chronic liver disease you can get this in your exam as a long case and pancreas could be also be an important case both in surgery as well as in medicine you get a large number of questions from this section also approach to jaundice again jaundice is a short case for you and you have the other diseases of the liver like could be liver abscess could be hepatocellular carcinoma and the diseases which involve the vasculature of the liver are very important the renal system again by far one of the common diseases which is on the rise is the chronic kidney disease so we have to know thoroughly about the chronic kidney disease we have to know acute kidney injury and the two important syndromes of nephritic and nephrotic syndrome kidney has a large number of roles that it plays in the entire homeostasis of the body there and that becomes very important for us to understand the functioning of the kidney so you get a large number of mcqs that are asked from this section also the same with fluid and electrolytes so sodium potassium calcium metabolism we have to know thoroughly and we have to understand the various causes and the effects and management of the electrolyte disorders acid base disorders a little complicated topic possibly but it's of importance both practically as well as in your day to day practice later you will encounter a large number of acid base disorders so we have to understand that the traditional very important disease that is the section on neurology that you have the stroke the movement disorders the epilepsy the headache the demyelinating disease the spinal cord disease the neuropathies that you have a large number of disorders the nervous system becomes almost all uh, centers where you have you get a long case of neurology that is there the stroke is kept or sometimes spinal cord disease is kept so you have a large number of diseases under this section and it's a very very interesting section of neurology very practically important both for your practical exams as well as a large number of questions are asked in theory also then you have a little smaller sections of uh, importance 
for your theory, sometimes in practicals asked also. Large number of MCQs come from these smaller sections starting from toxicology. So you do encounter organophosphorus, rat poison, the snake bite. So you have to know thoroughly about it. Oncology, again, large number of cancers are on the rise. So you could have blood cancers, the lung cancers, the endocrine cancers. So you have to know the drug therapy. And oncology is one section where the treatment of cancers changes by the day, not even months. It, every day the treatment changes. So we have to be updated. And you get a large number of multiple choice questions from this section of oncology. Psychiatry, it's a very, very important topic of practical relevance. You do get a large number of alcohol dependence cases. You do get patients with depression and suicidal tendencies. So we have to understand it. We should be able to give them the appropriate therapy only by understanding these. So you have a large number of topics which we have to understand in psychiatry also. Two small topics, genetics and immunology. You do get a large number of MCQs from this. Theory part may not be so important in your theory paper. Practical, they may not ask you. But these two sections are very important for your multiple choice questions that you have. The upcoming topic and the topic that has been given possibly the maximum weightage in the new CBME curriculum is geriatrics. The diseases of the elderly and how do we do a comprehensive geriatric assessment and how do you manage these patients. So it's very important this topic has to be given good importance there. Skin and uh, sexually transmitted diseases, very, very important topic. Again, you do encounter a large number of cases of uh, skin diseases in your practice, in your day-to-day -day practice. You'd be seeing it in your wards. And very important, in some centers, skin disease is kept as a spotter. So you do have to know about the common skin diseases, be it psoriasis, be it lichen planus, be it tinea, be it scabies, or some of the other cutaneous disorders. So it's important that these topics are this. So this is the overview of the medicine theory that we have. It is vast and in each section we have a large number of subtopics which we have to cover. So it's important that you have to give importance to them right from the beginning. It's not very practical to learn all of this in your final year. However, general tendency of students is to concentrate of medicine when you come to the final year only. But it is better that you do at least some amount of reading of these basic subjects right from the second year onwards whenever you have the topics that have been covered it will be much easier for you when you come to the final year more importantly since your clinics are going on parallelly so if you do not read on a topic it will be difficult for you to correlate that in your clinics so please read medicine side by side right from the second year onwards the new cbme curriculum has given a lot of importance for non-communicable diseases diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease and as I told you geriatrics has come up. So the topics are a little uh, classified differently and it is important for you because the CBME curriculum is going to be implemented and is on the way and it has to be a universal implementation there and uh, all over the uh, country you would have a standardized uh, sort of teaching, a standardized sort of assessment and most importantly, you will have a standardized end exam that would be there, which would give you the degree of your uh, post uh, undergraduation. The patterns in a theory paper, when you get a theory paper, the various patterns of how the questions are asked, of late, the change has happened to the case-based long questions. So in almost all universities and as per the guidelines of CBME also, the case-based questions are supposed to be the most important pattern of assessment that you would have. So you have a long question usually of 10 marks. So I'm just giving you an example here where you have a case scenario being given, a history uh, examination would be given followed by which you would be having the specific questions that would be asked for. So generally this is the long question pattern that would be there. So you could have one or more of that. Most of the universities have one or two case based long questions that you have to be aware. Also you could have a uh, case-based question but then they may not have multiple sub questions very important students it's to recognize whenever you answer a paper answer a theory paper is to concentrate on the sub questions so remember if this question has supposedly in this case here you have there is a diagnosis part of it there is the diagnostic feature and there is a management asked and then there is one more short notes been asked as list geriatric giants so again, remember, each of these have separate marking. So generally, the marking is mentioned. So 1, 3, 4, and 2. So there is sub-questions. 
and since most of the evaluation is happening online there is and we have separate sections that are there and each section has to be scored so if you club together and write it you generally do not uh, get up the each mark so because we require to have the individual so whenever there is a question that has been broken into marks make sure you attempt each separately and write it clearly only then the marking will happen so general mistake people do it is write it as a long question as long essay and the cuts are not written so sometimes you may not get a mark for a particular section even if it is written maybe it's not written very clearly so it's very important that you have to understand that when you answer a question if it's a structured uh, subdivisions are there you have to answer each subdivision separately the next type of questions that are generally asked are the structured long question where you have a full question that's written like you have this question here discuss the clotting pathways drugs acting on the same pathogenesis clinical features and management of consumptive coagulopathy so again here these are two different questions possibly but then the mark split has been given so generally you have to follow that here there is no case based so there is no case based but this is a long question that is asked then you have the short answer questions where they give you a specific maybe a four marker or a three marker where they ask you to describe or list something make sure you write very specific do not uh, uh, write too many things even if the question is you know the answer much so remember it's just a three marker or four marker so if it's a three marker six to seven good points is sufficient if it's a four marker eight to ten points is sufficient for that answer so again very well remember you have to time your question so generally you have two long questions and maybe 10 or 15 short notes so in a span of three hours you'll have to complete that so you have to time each question properly you have to give uh, maybe a 15 to 20 minutes for a long question and seven minutes for a short notes possibly and based on that you'll have to time it so it's very important that you have to understand how to answer the theory paper and please remember try to attempt all the questions and each question if you miss a question you lose that much of marks so you try to attempt all the questions and answer specifically answer the see the marks and then answer the question so that's about the theory how do you prepare and how do you write it again remember there are a large number of books that are available for your theory study it's always better to learn case based so whichever case you're seeing in your practical wards when you do your bedside make sure you come back and read so you can read any textbooks but it would be preferable that you read textbooks that are relevant to the indian context you do have a large number of textbooks which are of the west they do not give that Indian context of it and what is expected of you may not be covered uh, in those textbooks. Though they might be recommended textbooks for you, it is always better to read relevant textbooks to the Indian context. Coming on to practical, so that's the most difficult part, so, so, so called difficult part of your entire MBBS career that you have the medicine practicals. So the traditional pattern that you have in the practicals would be anything like this. You could have a long case, you could have a short case, you could have a semi-long case, then you have spotters, charts, OSCE in some universities, and you have the Viva Vose. Viva Vose would generally consider of instruments, drugs, charts, x-rays, ECGs, very important. So we have to know that these are the pattern that's there and each of these have particular marks. Long case, by far the largest chunk of the marks goes to that. It requires a good case sheet writing. And please remember, case sheet writing does not come on the exam day. You have to practice. You may have to write hundreds of case sheets, only then will you get the knack of writing a proper case sheet. And your case sheet is the, uh, that's the only evidence that is there that you have taken a proper history of examined the patient. That's the only paper that is there in the exam hall with you. So the case sheet speaks a lot. If you have a good case sheet you are written, Definitely, you'll be considered, even if you do not answer some questions, your good case sheet would have good wattage. So case sheet is of premium importance that's there. Without the case sheet, you will not be having a good chances of getting good marks. So case sheet is very important. And again, remember, your long case is time. Generally, you're given an hour for a long case where you're supposed to take the history, do the examination, write the case sheet. So you have to time it. Whenever you do the bedsides also, you have to time it. Do not simply take the history then do the examination and then write the case sheet so you have to do it parallelly and you have to be very very systematic in a long case all systems are supposed to be examined that is very very important short cases they would give a specific system and ask you some findings and discuss semi long cases usually are therapeutic problems be it diabetic anemia jaundice fever such things 
very important in all your patients you have to do the general examination so general examination is mandatory you will have to check the blood pressure pulse rate etc in all the patients do not miss that because that is vital so without that we cannot proceed to any examination charts uh, generally you have the lab data that's kept as chart or a clinical case can be kept as chart and discussion can happen oscis very important remember there are two types of oscis that are there one is the manned and the unmanned oscis the manned oscis where you're given to elicit a particular sign and there's somebody who's observing it they generally have a checklist of it and based on the checklist you get the marks oscis is the best way to remove all the bias of exams because there is a checklist that is there and whoever has performed based on the checklist would get the full mark however oscis is not coming into full vogue as of now but i think with the cbme curriculum progressing oscis will become the main code mainstay of your assessment especially when your next exam comes okay after your internship when you're going to be assessed OSCE is going to be of paramount importance. You could have spotters. Generally, the skin diseases are kept as spotters or clubbing or cyanosis or something like that is kept as spotter and they ask you questions on that. When you come into Viva OC, it's very important that we have to carefully uh, understand about the drugs, the x-rays, the ECGs, the instruments that are commonly used. So you have to make sure that you're familiarized with that and you have to know certain uh, basic points of each of them and that's where you can score when we see a respiratory system by far has a large number of cases starting from asthma to COPD to bronchiectasis pleural effusion pneumothorax you could have ILD you could have consolidation fibrosis fibrothorax you have large number of cases so make sure when you do your clinical postings you at least acclimatize with these cases know the findings of this and examine the patients take the histories and so that you don't get confused when you're given a case in the exam. Same with cardiovascular system. You have a large number of valvular heart disease which are still kept for you as exams. And you sometimes have congenital heart disease is also kept. And of late, we have the new cases that are kept of heart failure. So heart failure is an important case that's kept. Core pulmonale can be kept. So you have to make sure that you have... And cardiac examination, a lot of findings are there on auscultation. So you have to make sure that you have done it once or many times earlier in your bedsides only then you will be able to identify GIT by far the easiest system because number of diseases are pretty less there so it could have jaundice you have liver abscess uh, you could have a chronic liver disease hepatomegaly splenomegaly and sometimes a palpable kidney these are the cases you have a very short list of cases and it's relatively easy the findings are pretty obvious and uh, clinical eliciting of signs is also very simple in GIT so these are the standard cases you have to be prepared. So when you do a bedside, when you are in your uh, postings, that's when you have to look at all these cases and try to present as many cases of this to get acclimatized. Nervous system, again, by far the most systematic system that we have in the entire system is nervous system, where one plus one always has to be two. The signs are very, very obvious. An extensor plantar is an extensor, you elicit or I elicit. A reflex is exaggerated, it's exaggerated. There's no ambiguity in that. And there is localization that's very, very uh, straightforward in case of nervous system. So there's no ambiguity when you look at the nervous system examination. Nervous system examination is very, very systematic. But we do have a large number of cases. You have stroke, you have peripheral neuropathy, you have ataxia, you have demyelinating diseases, you have Parkinson's disease that can be there, a spinal cord disease can be kept, a cranial nerve like facial nerve palsy can be kept, and you can have uh, peripheral neuropathies like foot drop, claw hand, all these cases can be kept. Uh, very important nervous system examination has a very, very systemic format, which if you follow, you will be able to localize very, very simple. So in the long case, as I've already emphasized, very important, please concentrate on a good history, write the good history in a particular format that's there. I think we have discussed in the various sessions about the individual formats, how to be written and how do we summarize. So very important is to summary and at the end of the summary, you're supposed to give a provisional diagnosis. So based on the provisional diagnosis, you can approach to the next system. Very important, general examination is a most important thing. General examination will give you a lot of clues and then you go to the relevant system examination and please remember in long case, all systems have to be examined. Even in a stroke patient, you have to do a cardiovascular, respiratory and GIT. In a GIT case, you'll have to do the neurological, respiratory and cardiovascular. So all systems have to be written. Again, you should have a final summary and then the final diagnosis. 
and possibly what are the appropriate investigations that you would want to do in a particular case we may have to mention. So long case has a case sheet that's the most important thing please remember case sheet this carries a lot of wettage do not use short forms in case sheets do follow the particular order and write it neatly do not unnecessarily strike out and all those things make it neat and please remember the case sheet also has to be written in the stipulated time that is given maybe one hour one hour 15 minutes you will not be given additional time usually the case sheets will be collected off and if your case sheet is incomplete that shows that you have not done it enough times possibly in your entire MBBS course so that uh, you are not able to write it in that part. So case sheet gives very much impression about how you have uh, finished your three years of uh, clinical posting. So case sheet is very much important. When we see the short cases or the semi long cases there we don't require the case sheets that are there. So the case sheets are not important it's just the findings that we look for. You look for whether the particular system that's been there and how that system has been uh, examined that's what is important. So this is how a case sheet would be looking like possibly you have a full detailed case sheet that's there which is written the patient the history of presenting illness and it has to be quite detailed only then you'll be able to write and arrive at a particular diagnosis. The diagnostic formats I'm just giving an example of the cardiovascular system each system has its diagnostic format so you have the cardiovascular system where you have this eight headings in which you write the diagnostic format. So all your diseases which you write the final diagnosis has to have a particular format. Now what's important to write it in the format because that will show that you understand the subject well. Okay, It's not just to show off that you know it perfect but it is how you understand the subject and based on these you can uh, possibly ask for investigations and the management also would be uh, based on that. So your example for a cardiovascular system would be like an acquired valvular heart disease, rheumatic in etiology, severe mitral stenosis, moderate mitral regurgitation, severe pulmonary artery hypertension, patient in atrial fibrillation and congestive cardiac failure with no signs of infective endocarditis, thromboembolism or active rheumatic carditis, patient is in NYHA class 3. So this good diagnosis would speak a lot about how well you know the subject and how well you have written your case sheets in the bedsides. Every disease has its format so RS, CVS everything has a particular format we have discussed each of them in the individual sections. So when we write a respiratory diagnosis we write it as right upper lobe fibrosis, post tubercular in etiology, no evidence of respiratory failure or core pulmonary. If we do the GIT format so again you have a standard format for GIT where you can write it as a decompensated chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, secondary to alcohol, with portal hypertension, with UGI bleed, patient in stage 2 hepatic encephalopathy with no evidence of SBP or other complications. So again each disease has its format and this format has to be remembered and written in your long case. The short case and semi long cases you do not have much of uh, uh, writing purpose. You will have to present the case, you have to examine, remember the findings and present it and you will have to discuss the approach to that. Short cases generally have one system which is involved where we will have abnormalities. Semi longer therapeutic cases may not have clinical findings. They may have a good history and then certain past histories or certain treatment histories you will have to take and then you will have to discuss the approach to the patient. For example, a patient with diabetes has come, he may not have major findings but then you will have to take history of a neuropathy or a retinopathy and what are the investigations that you would ask or what are the examinations that you would do in a patient with diabetes or hypertension or a chronic kidney disease that is what is going to be attached in a semi long case or therapeutic case. The common ones which are kept for semi long are the renal cases like maybe a nephrotic syndrome or a CKD, rheumatological cases are kept for examination, endocrine as I have discussed about diabetes or thyroid is usually kept for a semi long or therapeutic case, hematological cases like anemia, uh, lymph nodes, general cases like fever, edema, heart failure and geriatric assessment has come up as a semi long case that's come in the CBME curriculum that geriatric assessment what is specific that you look for in a elderly person. So all these things are approach based uh, cases that we have to discuss. Spotters usually are a very spotter they just show you and you have to identify it and then maybe discuss it. So like this you have a clubbing that's there pan digital clubbing so they may ask you causes and then the etiologies and the grades. This is one more spotter where you have erythematous lesions on the shin that you see 
So this is looking like erythema nodosum. So what are the causes they'll ask you and how do you approach? This is again a spotter here where you have obesity, stri, pigmented, buffalo hump, moon faces. So you know that it is Cushing syndrome that we see. When we come on the uh, OSCE pattern, so they may ask you uh, to find out demonstrate signs of heart failure in a particular patient, a man station. So generally the checklist that is given to the uh, person who is the observer is how do you do it? So whether the patient, uh, you have come and spoken to the patient, have you done your hand wash prior to that? Have you examined generally? Have you checked the pulse? Have you checked the blood pressure? Have you checked for the peripheral pulses? Did you do the JVP examination? Did you check for pedal edema? Did you uh, look for the apical impulse? Did you auscultate for S3? Did you auscultate for basal crepitations? Did you do the abdominal examination for liver and ascites? And how did you close? So based on this, you would give in a score. Maybe you might be given the 3, 2 or 0 that's there based on that score. And the total score would be calculated. And you have an objectivity here. Because whoever sits and uh, finds it, they will find this part of it that could be there. So OSCE is a very good examination uh, technique which removes the bias of examiner. And you can assess a large number of skills. You can assess skills, you can assess therapeutics, you can assess communication and many things can be assessed through OSCE. With the CBME curriculum coming up, communication, the attitude, the ethics that is going to come, all of them are going to be assessed through OSCE. Clinical case scenarios, normally it's kept for your uh, uh, charts. So you could be given a clinical case scenario of particular thing with a particular history and they would give you certain examination findings or an image they might have given it. Uh, this can be given as spotters also that could be there and they'll ask you a particular question, set of questions. So what's your diagnosis? How do you approach? What are the reasons for these findings? So again, it could be a 5 marker or 10 marker. So based on what is the uh, pattern that has been given. So clinical case scenarios are an important part it's asked in spotters also very importantly it's a very important part of your vivas also which generally carries a set amount of marks based on the number of questions that is asked again remember this is very scoring because the questions are fixed the marks is also fixed so if you answer it properly you would get the full marks that is allotted for that third type, uh, type of oski is where you have a mixture of both you have a clinical scenario given and then there are investigations that are given and based on that, how do you approach is one more type of OSCE that can be thought of. So again, there are standard questions and you'll have to have the answers for that. And based on that, the marks would be given. Again, OSCE is a very important pattern for scoring and you know it, you know, uh, you can get the full marks that could be there. So again, they have an answer key. There is a checklist that's there and based on that, you would get the marks. So OSCE is going to come up as one of the main parts of assessment, especially when your next exam that is going to come, OSCE is going to be of the most importance in the entire evaluation of your all MBBS course, not only medicine, all of the courses would be assessed based on that. The Viva OC generally consists of four stations in most of the places. So you have uh, instruments, drugs, ECGs, X-rays. So they ask you, they give you something and they ask you about it. So you have to be very much aware of common ECG findings and how do you interpret it. Again, we have a separate session which has been taken where you have taught about the common ECGs and how do you manage the abnormalities. Same thing is with the X-rays also. So you are given one or two X-rays and they ask you to identify the abnormality and give the causes. So you have a miliary mottling or a pleural effusion or a collapse or a pericardial effusion or a valvular heart disease that's kept and they will ask you what are the findings and why do you say so. Also instruments, so commonly used instrument be a bone marrow biopsy needle, a liver biopsy needle or a lumbar puncture needle, a Foley's catheter. So you have a standard set of instruments that are kept. Make sure you have seen it at least once and identified properly and then you'll have to know why it's used, the indications, the contraindications and if a procedure is involved, you'll have to know the standard steps of the procedure and the complications. Also you have to know the findings. Supposedly a lumbar puncture needle is kept, you should know the findings of CSF analysis. If it's a bone marrow needle, then you'll have to know the bone marrow aspiration findings of a particular disease that is going to be asked. Case-based learning has been given a large amount of importance in the new curriculum and every disease is been taught like a case-based. So you do start with a case and then discuss the clinical features and then correlate it pathologically and then go to the investigations and then find a final diagnosis and then you go to the management of it. So 
generally if you see here you have a case given here where a patient is conscious oriented uh, person who has come and he has a 74 pulse meet there is and there is bounding pulse that you are seeing there and then you have a JVP is elevated to the ear lobule the patient has lymphadenopathy uh, pallor there is pedal edema that's there and there is no signs of liver cell failure in this patient there is no sternal tenderness or ecchymosis and per abdomen examination shows that the abdomen is distended and there is palpation shows that there is a uh, liver that is palpable 12 centimeters and the spleen that is palpable 10 centimeters and the liver span is 18 centimeters and the bowel sounds are normal the parietal examination is normal so based on this what is your diagnosis so they give you a case with all the findings and they can ask you how do you approach it how do you go for the uh, evaluation and what's a differential diagnosis and how do you treat this patient so this is the case based learning which is coming up also you have a problem based learning where a particular problem is given a patient comes with bleeding so a GI bleeding so you'll have to ask for it so what are the questions that we ask what are the examination findings that we do and then how do we uh, go about evaluating the other important portion that you have to concentrate whenever you read a topic be it theory or practical MCQs. So multiple choice questions is imperative. They are asked in your final exams maybe but your entrance exams whichever is later you are going to face is based on multiple choice questions only. So what has changed from multiple choice questions traditionally where the recall based MCQs, the percentages were asked. Now it has become more clinical MCQs that are there and clinical MCQs could be image related, could be uh, uh, x-ray related or a clinical sign being demonstrated or maybe a case based and they ask such questions. So multiple choice questions you have to read parallelly from standard books whichever is available and you have to correlate with that and then score it and I would advise you whenever you finish a portion of one topic or something you can refer a standard book of MCQ and try to solve all of them and then see how much you score. MCQs require a detailed uh, knowledge of the subject. Again multiple choice questions some of the uh, some believe that it is very superficial learning of the subject but very importantly multiple choice questions if it's a problem based or a case based it requires a complete understanding of the subject and many times the choices in MCQs uh, you get very close choices the choices are pretty close there so it's difficult to make out where or which is the answer so unless you understand it thoroughly you will not be able to uh, localize the answer so if they ask you the most common presentation of CQ thyroid so you have to know what is CQ thyroid and then you have to know the, all the abnormalities and which is the commonest one. So you have to know this only then you will be understanding it. So MCQs requires quite in-depth knowledge of the subject as well as you will have to clinically correlate. Only then you will be able to localize the particular answer. What I was asking or what I was telling about is the clinical based MCQs where it came. So you have a 54 year old Asian woman who has come with tuberculosis in the past now has breathlessness. The JVP shows a very prominent X and Y descent. So you have to know about JVP, you have to know about what can tuberculosis cause and why is this patient. So only then you will be able to make out the diagnosis that it could be constrictive pericarditis secondary to tuberculosis. Otherwise JVP elevation can occur in all of these conditions. Which condition produces X and Y descent and what is the cause? Why tuberculosis? That is the cause for constrictive pericarditis. So that is how you have to know the case based. So it requires in-depth knowledge as well as analysis. So they might give you a case scenario and then they may give you a particular lab investigations and they can ask you what is the diagnosis. So this is more important. So here the stem of the MCQ is pretty long. So you will have to read about it. You have to analyze it and then give the diagnosis. So it takes time. So unless you work on such MCQs regularly, it might be difficult because remember multiple choice questions when it's given in an exam is a time based. You generally have one and a half to two minutes possibly per MCQ if you uh, do it uh, properly. So it is very important that you have to be quick and you have to analyze and then you have to give a diagnosis of what is the possible diagnosis. So what does DigiNerv offer? So DigiNerv offers all of this what I have told in this uh, last session whatever I have told. We are offering here about the theory, we are offering you practical related stuff, we are offering you case based stuff that is there, multiple choice questions and how do you approach. So we are providing all these things in the form of videos, there is demonstration techniques that have been told, the case sheet formats which we have written, the diagnosis format, everything has been described 
under various sections and it is elaborately explained with examples. So it is a very important uh, way of understanding the subject and you can uh, see it again and again, you can revise the topic again and again, if you have difficulty you can ask questions and you can ask, uh, you can ask for clarifications. So Digina offers all of them in one platform, the theory, the practical, the MCQs, the clinical portion, everything in one particular platform that's provided by Diginav. So you have standard books that are there, but uh, basically the two important books, which has been written by me, that is the basic source for the major stuff that we are going to be uh, discussing. The theory book, that's the exam preparatory manual, which is in the third edition and the clinical book, that is the insider's guide to clinical medicine, that's the first edition. So majority of the stuff that has been covered in the Diginav platform basically becomes to these two books. I would conclude by saying, in God we trust, all others we must have data. This is a, a statement given by Bernard Fisher. So it's only God that we can trust truly. For every other thing, be it related to medicine or unrelated medicine, we should have data to prove that that is right. So trust does not come just like that unless there is a data. So DigiNerve, through DigiNerve, we are offering you certain data which can be trustworthy and you can trust on it and you can believe and practice what is being told through these classes. Students, I wish you the best of luck and I wish you success in your medical careers. Thank you.